Welcome everyone and hello from Singapore. My name is Neil McRae and I'm an independent education consultant and trainer for fieldwork education. I'm indebted to Catherine Copeland, the Director of Global Education, who presented this information as part of her keynote presentation at an ANPS conference in March 2021. And I'm delighted to address British schools in the Middle East through this webinar. I'm sharing this presentation with you on behalf of Fieldwork Education, the providers of the International Primary Curriculum, the International Early Years Curriculum, and the International Middle Years Curriculum. And I'm pleased to speak with you today about global competence and the new classroom, and how to harness that global competence to navigate these challenging times. In our 21st century, children and young people the world over are growing up in an interconnected, diverse and rapidly changing world. Globalisation, which includes international trade, digital connectivity, migration and cultural interactions, challenges educators to rethink the purpose of education. And we need to ask three key questions. What do we need children to learn today? How best do we prepare them for the world? And as teachers, how do we get this right? Well, one organization that's been focusing on this is the OECD, or Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And they launched a new framework for educating for global competence at Harvard Project Zero. This happened in 2017, and the framework outlines global competence as a core educational aim for our times. What do we mean by this? Well, here's an OECD definition. Global competence is the capacity to examine local, global, and intercultural issues, to understand and appreciate the perspectives and worldviews of others, to engage in open, appropriate and effective interactions with people from different cultures and to act for collective well-being and sustainable development. And you can see those as the four areas on the wheel on the screen now. The outside circle emphasizes skills, knowledge, values and attitudes and we'll unpack these areas as we go through the presentation. So why then do we need global competence? Well, education in global competence can boost employability as young people become able to investigate and develop a position about an issue of local or global significance. They can collaborate in culturally diverse teams and appreciate different perspectives and languages. Perhaps most importantly, in today's increasingly diverse societies, educating for global competence can promote a cultural awareness and respectful interactions with others. And this is never more important than now. As I speak to you today, the UN Climate Change Conference, or COP26, is taking place in Glasgow, in Scotland, in the UK. And we await the decisions from this conference really urgently because we know that action now is essential. What fieldwork education does is recognize the two-fold purpose of this OECD perspective. The children need to develop and understand identity, local culture, citizenship, but also develop a growing capacity to take perspective, to communicate across differences, and to take action collaboratively and creatively to solve social, political, economic, and environmental change challenges. But something has profoundly influenced what's happened over the last couple of years. And of course, that's the COVID-19 pandemic. The outbreak of this across the world has profoundly altered almost every aspect of life, including, of course, education. Now, during these 
challenging times, the focus of online learning has brought ideas about how we educate our young people and made that, that at the forefront of educational debate. And the impact of COVID-19 has perhaps actually given us an opportunity to deeply rethink the path that we need to take going forward. It's not difficult to see that global competence learning is highly necessary for the healthy future of our students and the future of our planet. So what are the challenges that have arisen from the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, there are obvious ones that you can see listed on screen here. But for us as educationists, perhaps our challenge is to reduce as much as possible the negative impact that this pandemic has had and is going to continue to have on learning and schooling. And as education systems cope with this crisis, they need to recognize some of the factors that influence how education recovers, including those we've listed. So it's all about the best kind of recovery, developing a greater sense of individual, national and global responsibility, using digital innovation and the power of student voice to make these changes a force for good. So we're going to explore three different global competencies, three dimensions in which global competence can be developed. Now the first highlights the willingness and capacity to consider global problems from multiple viewpoints. And as individuals acquire knowledge about other cultures, histories, and values, and their communication styles, beliefs and practices, these individuals then begin to recognize that their perspectives and their behaviors are shaped by many influences around them. And perhaps they also begin to appreciate that they weren't really fully aware of these influences and that others have views of the world that may be profoundly different from their own. Our second dimension is engaging in appropriate and effective interactions across cultures. And globally competent people can adapt their behavior and communication to interact with individuals from different cultures. And this includes engaging in respectful dialogue, wanting to understand the other person, and trying to include marginalized groups within that dialogue. And this dimension emphasizes individuals' capacity to bridge differences with others by communicating in ways that are open, appropriate, and effective. Our third dimension is about taking action. That's action for collective well-being and sustainable development. And this dimension focuses on young people's roles as active and responsible members of society and refers to individuals' readiness to respond to any given local, global, or intercultural issue or situation. And it recognizes that young people can have an impact on these personal and local situations, but also on digital and global issues too. Competent people create opportunities to take informed, reflective action and to have their voices heard. So how then can schools, can you promote global competence? Well, that shock of COVID-19 has been a huge upheaval in education all around the world. And schools, even if they're doing online teaching, are still in a unique position to influence the future. What they can do is provide opportunities for young people to critically examine developments that are significant to both the world and their own lives. They can teach students how to use digital information and social and media platforms critically and responsibly. And schools can also encourage intercultural respect through engagement and experiences that really nurture an appreciation for diverse peoples, language, and culture. So 
what about these sustainable development goals that you may have heard of? Well, this is one way to start thinking about really engaging with global competence. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are 17 in number, and each of them is an urgent call to action by all countries around the world, both developed and developing in a global partnership. And they recognize that ending poverty and other deprivation must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality and spur on economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and our forests. So here's the SDG manifesto. If you read it, you'll see that it's a powerful tool for students to imagine their future. I don't think many of us would argue with these aims and goals, and I'm just going to give you a moment to read and reflect on them. So as schools, what can we do? Well, as fieldwork education explains in their guidance on using SDGs in schools, local, community and international schools can all be centres of good practice and awareness raising about SDGs. And their guidance says the Sustainable Development Goals are the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. And these goals interconnect. And so in order to leave no one behind, it's really important that we achieve each goal and target by the deadline of 2030. But global competence has had another focus too. It's now included as a new domain in the Programme for International Student Assessment, commonly called PISA, an influential international large-scale test of 15-year-old student achievement. So how can we support young people to understand who they are in this interconnected world? Prepare them to consider multiple perspectives as they collaborate with others and provide opportunities for them to participate positively in civic life, school and work. Well, many governments, school districts, schools and curricula are turning to these sustainable development goals as a guidance for deepening their global competence. Our field workers work very hard to integrate aspects of global competence into all of their curricula. And they use this definition from Bucks, Mansilla and Jackson, defining global competence as the capacity and disposition to understand and act on issues of global significance. Now, these researchers also identified four competences, and you can see them on the wheel here. Investigating the world, recognizing perspectives, communicating ideas, and that one again, taking action. And this is very much the inspiration for fieldwork education's approach to developing student agency and global competence. So, what do we mean when we talk about globally competent students? What do they look like? We've defined the ideas and missions and motivations from that global perspective, but what about the pedagogy in practice in schools? What about that student perspective? Well, as you'll know, when designing curriculums, it's always a good idea to start with your objective. What is it that we want students to learn? Well, I think it's summarized very much here in the infographic that you can see on this screen. We want our students and future citizens to be change makers, global citizens, to demonstrate student agency, be internationally minded. They're just a few examples of the many desired outcomes. But the big question, of course, then is how do we get here? Well, there are many pedagogies and curricula that develop global competence and put that into what we might call global education. 
and around all of the many definitions and descriptions, one thing remains constant, that global education is about deepening critical thinking about global issues. And you can see a couple of sources here of those definitions about what we might mean by global education. One of them indeed comes from the Maastricht Declaration on Global Education from 2002. So let's look at another famous statement about global education and global issues. And here it is from Dennis Van Ronkel, the U.S. National Education Association president. And he said, the 21st century isn't coming. It's already here. And our students have the opportunity and challenge of living and working in a diverse and rapidly changing world. So public schools must prepare our young people to understand and address global issues. And educators must re-examine their teaching strategies and curriculum so that all students can thrive in this global and interdependent society. So what does a global education that develops global perspectives and global competence offer students and teachers? Well, we need to think about what the global issues might be. And here are just a few of those listed down on the left-hand side of this screen. And a global education that develops global perspectives and global competence will explore some, many perhaps, of the global issues that you can see here that affect us all. But of course, in order to develop globally competent students, we also need to develop globally competent schools. And what does a globally competent school look like? How do they design their globalism in the curriculum? Well, schools that support and model this kind of culture and invest in global competence and development of that in their curriculum will better prepare all of their students for the future. And we might expect to see the kinds of things that you can see on the right of the screen here. For example, an emphasis on the future, an opportunity to explore important themes and a focus on cooperative learning and action. What then are the pedagogies that might support global competence? Well, I think some of them are listed clearly here. Preparing students for today's world requires not only that we think about what matters most for them to learn, but also what kind of teaching and learning will be most effective. So teachers today need to prepare students for that increasingly competent, complex, interconnected and interdependent world and different kinds of learning, service learning, inquiry-based learning, structured debates, outdoor education and food literacy are some of the pedagogical approaches that will support the development of global competence. And we'll look at a few of these as we go through this presentation. So what can teachers actively do in their classroom? How can you contribute and develop these ideas? Well, global competence is about the world now. It's about understanding ourselves and our place in the world. And the three areas for teachers to develop are in disposition, knowledge, and skills. And just like any teaching practice, there's a continuum of learning to become a better practitioner. But essentially, the tone that we set in our classrooms to nurture students' curiosity and motivate them to learn about the world and how they fit into it. We can start with classroom resources that represent the diversity of places and people around the world. And the final part of this presentation is full of practical examples for you to use. And you can see some of the things that you can start doing as a teacher here listed in the bullet points on the right-hand side of your screen. So how then do we embed these SDGs into our curricular units or our plans? Well, 
by embedding global competence co content knowledge, we can actually integrate it across all subjects and across all grades. It's, it's never really an add-on at all. And fieldwork education has defined how to develop global competence and international mindedness. And each of the units in any of the three curricula that you can see there, the IYC, the IPC, or the IMYC, all have lots of examples that help teachers be guided by questions that are focusing on student inquiry, looking into global issues that relate to SDGs. And I've extracted one here for you on littering. And you can see the kind of planning support that's provided in all of these fieldwork units. Now, what fieldwork hopes, of course, is that global competence will add to the curriculum. This sense that children are capable of influencing change, making change themselves, and making that both positive and invaluable to those around them. And what they do is encourage schools to help students to realize that just one person can have influence over others and to harness that learner agency for positive change. Tuning into ideas that students have throughout the units of learning and where appropriate, encouraging them to be the agents of change themselves. Now, one way to do this is through something called the world's largest lesson. And if you're looking for somewhere to start, you can take a look at the free website called the world's largest lesson, which is in collaboration with UNESCO and UNICEF. And it's filled with all kinds of lesson plans, videos and ideas to implement sustainability goals into your lessons, including those from the late and very great Sir Ken Robertson, who you can see on screen in the centre of this image. But what about more resources for teaching SDGs? Well, as promised, I said that I'd include lots of examples for you. And we can start with those that you can see on screen here. These are free and they're fun. They're learning tools for teaching lots of different dimensions of those SDGs. So teach SDGs, open and accessible resources, lesson plans, global projects, all aligned to the SDGs themselves. The SDG Academy, a group that creates and curates free open educational resources on sustainable development. The Atlas of Sustainable Development Goals 2020 presents interactive storytelling and data visualization for each of the 17 goals. Go Goals provides a fun game to support learning and Comics Uniting the Nations as multilingual comics relating to the SDGs. Well, that's just the start of the many resources that are available for you to explore. Let's look at some more of these. Project-based learning. Students working together on projects over time that engage them in real-world problem solving. And there are lots of uh, agencies that can help you do this. And rather than giving tasks here, of course, teachers assign projects. And of course, this style does mimic the modern workplace, a collaborative environment where problem solving and creativity are a crucial skill set. Now, there are lots of different resources here that you can use and lots of collaborative tools that you can use to help you too. I've listed a few of them here, Padlet, Flipgrid, Nearpod, Pear Deck, Skype, and many, many others. What about bringing the world into your classroom? Well, if you can't travel or perhaps can't even visit the library, how do you bring the world to your students? Well, there are lots of fun ideas here, and I've included some of them, again, in a column on the right side of the screen. For example, Global Read Aloud. There's the link. The premise is really simple. A book is picked to read aloud to students during a set six-week period, and during that time, they have to make as many global connections as possible. Some teachers choose just to connect with one class while others go for as many as possible. And this is the beauty of our interactive world. We can integrate and link with schools and other communities around the world. And fieldwork makes this particularly easy 
through their curriculum. Every curriculum has what's called a pin board, which allows teachers to communicate with all the other fieldwork schools around the world. Another one, book creator, you can see listed here, has students making their own books, which they can then share with each other and, of course, others online. Now, in addition to that, augmented reality and virtual reality technology, which is ever developing, can help bring some of these experiences to life. You can see here the students posing with their Mars rover in augmented reality form in their fieldwork IPC unit mission to Mars. But we can also go further than that too and have virtual field trips along with virtual reality. Now, real field trips get students out into the world exploring the world and their interests. So that might include, for example, trips to museums or parks or historical sites and many more. Now, due to the epidemic, of course, for many schools and students, field trips are rare, even if they happen at all. But thankfully, there are great opportunities around this, and I've listed some of them here. These field trip tools can facilitate opportunities for students to communicate and share experiences through the use of virtual field trips, which allow these interactions between students. And if schools have the technology, virtual reality can inject even more realism into these virtual travel experiences. Well, another way is to bring students into the world by using technology and the importance of global competence to make sense of this global pandemic. So whenever young people connect through a virtual connection, they're learning about one another's lives and cultures and language and faith and hopes and aspirations and interests and passions. And these kinds of interactive experiences, these virtual exchanges, can allow young people to connect with someone in another part of the world, whether it's an author visit or an expert presentation or collaborative projects or global debates, any of these listed on screen that you can see here right now. Of course, what this does too is make students learning highly relevant for them. And that brings us to the idea of media literacy and digital citizenship. Now, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated our reliance on technology. And of course, with this reliance, we need to ensure that students are media savvy, are media literate. It's critical for their development. So we need to be able to utilize technology to maintain instruction, but also to give students information about how they can best negotiate that digital environment. And lots of schools have done this in very positive ways. So, for example, at Keystone Academy in Beijing, students earn badges for skills related to digital citizenship and media literacy. And there are lots and lots of innovative ideas that schools are developing in this challenging time. But we can also look at things like service learning. Well, what do we mean by this? Well, lots of schools around the world have engaged in this pre-pandemic. It's a curriculum-based course or a combination of courses in which students participate in meaningful, sustained community service. And service learning brings students and teachers squarely together to address, for example, community needs, providing opportunities for active learning, feedback from community practitioners, lots of collaboration, mentorships to help them connect theory to practice, and all kinds of different activities. Now, of course, our challenge is what do we do and how do we do it in a post-COVID environment, an online environment? Well, we can do service projects online. We can tutor children or read to them or with them. We can tutor others in a second language. We can write newsletters and blog posts. We're not limited to a complete extent. There are still things that we can do. Uh, I've heard even of one school where 
students and teachers work together to launch a startup business to meet a specific community need. Another area that we can focus on is what's often called food literacy. It's becoming increasingly critical for students around the world to become literate about food in a nutritional, environmental and socio-cultural sense. And this gives them the ability to make better decisions when purchasing or consuming food. So experiencing how to grow and taste and cook food enhances their health and well-being. Integrating a global approach to food literacy and cross-disciplinary studies will help create globally-minded citizens, which in turn will help improve the lives of children around the world, their environment and their community. Projects could include some of the things that are listed here, planting an edible garden, finding out about pollution and food, cooking healthy meals and much, much more. We can also turn to something that we might call climate change action. Now, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, has said, we cannot wait any longer for bold and decisive climate action. And the Climate Action Project was started by Cohen Timmers, and it's a free online project with a curriculum that allows teachers and students to collaborate on a global scale about key topics over a course of six exciting weeks. And as you can see, over two and a half million students are involved in 135 countries with this one specific mission of taking action. Now, just in the last few days, the COP26 Climate Change Conference has been taking place. And one of the key figures that addressed the conference was Sir David Attenborough. And his words perhaps have never been more important. And they are here on screen on the left. But it's as we come to the end of this presentation, just worth noting them and saying them aloud. It comes down to this, he said. The people alive now and the generation to come will look at this conference and consider one thing. Did the numbers stop rising and start to drop as a result of commitments made here? There's every reason to believe that the answer can be yes. If working apart, we are forces powerful enough to destabilize our planet, surely working together, we're powerful enough to save it. That desperate hope is why the world is looking to you and why you are here. So, as we come towards the end of this presentation, there are a few more things that we can look at to explore. We might want to consider animal welfare and our natural world, and one person that epitomizes the kind of advocacy that we desire to develop in our students is Dr. Jane Goodall. She's known to many people, and as she said here, every day you live, you make an impact on the planet. The key thing is what kind of difference, what kind of impact do you want to make? And there are lots of other role models for our young learners, whether it's Sir David Attenborough or Jane Goodall or Greta Thunberg or Sebastian Salgado and many, many others. They often have learning programs that they can tap into. And in addition to that, there are young role models, as you can see, in the bottom right of the screen here, that find their own voices through Facebook, through Instagram, through YouTube, and so on. Now, coming to the end of this presentation, which I hope you found really useful, I, or more accurately, Catherine Copeland, the Director of Global Education, who presented the original version of this presentation as part of her keynote address, at that ANPS conference earlier this year, created this list of resources, many of which contributed to the research for this presentation. So finally, 
I want to say thank you to you for listening to this presentation, but also specifically thank you to Catherine again for providing all these resources. You can see there a global education link, the website, and also the fieldwork website. And just a final note. As we've acknowledged, the shock of the COVID-19 crisis on ed education has been unprecedented. It's, it's set the clock back on the attainment of those international education goals, and perhaps most significantly, it's disproportionately affected the poorer and most vulnerable in our society. And yet, the education community has proved resilient, laying groundwork for this rebound. There's lots of drive, lots of untapped resources that we can use. And as we wait expectantly for the outcomes of the COP26 conference in Glasgow, we acknowledge that it's the responsibility of governments and the international community to stay true to these key principles and reforms that are at the heart of global change for good. But there's also an essential role for yourselves, for educators and students of all ages across the world to help make this happen. So, my final message, help to harness that idealism and aspiration that so many of our young people demonstrate and go out and use global education and global competence to help navigate us through these difficult times. Thank you again, and I hope you've enjoyed this BFME presentation.